Less than 24 hours after he turned himself into police, R&B singer R. Kelly has just been granted bail with conditions after a dramatic hearing that featured some of the graphic sex abuse allegations against him. His bond has been set at $1 million and he's been ordered to turn over his passport and have no contact with any of his alleged victims or anyone under the age of 18. The 52-year-old faces 10 counts of aggravated criminal sexual abuse stemming from four accusers, at least three of them under the age of 17. The alleged encounters happened between 1998 to 2010. CNN's Sarah Seidner is at the courthouse where the hearing just wrapped up a short time ago. And Sarah, a prosecutor read graphic details of the charges against Kelly during the hearing. What can you tell us about what she said? Look, this is the reality of this case. It is going to be difficult to listen to and imagine being family members of the alleged victims who were also listening to some of these details in court. I can now tell you we have confirmed that one of the alleged victims in this case was in court today. I had a very short conversation with her. She is now being represented by Michael Avenatti. Uh, I can tell you that she was emotional, as you might imagine, uh, in this particular courthouse today as bond was being set. Uh, the state's attorney had at, at first asked for no bond. Uh, what we now know is that bond has been granted uh, and he can pay $100,000 total to uh, get out of jail and be able to be out of jail until his trial. However, uh, the bond was $250,000 per alleged victim, which means the total amount was a million uh, dollars. Uh, at this point, his attorney has said, you know, that he is having all sorts of money problems uh, because he's been dropped from his record label, among other things. Uh, and he has also proclaimed his client's innocence, Steve Greenberg, uh, coming very hard out saying uh, that the victims, he says, are liars uh, or that they were at the age of consent uh, at the time, uh, denying what had been said in court. In court, the one of the state's attorneys uh, talked about some of the details, uh, very graphic details. I will not get into all of them. I will give you just uh, a, a little bit of an idea of what is being said. Uh, they said that in one case there was a woman uh, who was of age, but she was a hairdresser. Uh, R. Kelly had asked to be able to go back uh, and get his hair done, and then he came out with his genitalia out of his pants uh, and asked her to perform oral sex, for example. Uh, she says she resisted, uh, and so she is one of the victims. Uh, who has come forward to the state's attorney's office. We also heard about three other girls who the prosecution says were not of age, were under the age of 17, uh, one of whom talked about being spit on and slapped and uh, also being engaged by R. Kelly in sexual acts as well. Uh, as this was going on, the families inside, there was at least one family whose daughter is with R. Kelly. She is of age but was not of age when she first started uh, to be with him without her parents around. Uh, they were very, very upset in court. The mother coming out, her name uh, is Alice Clary. She came out and sobbed in her husband's arms because she was unable to have any contact with her daughter. Her daughter, she said, would just look straight ahead and would not acknowledge her. She has claimed that her daughter is brainwashed along with another girl who was uh, by her side, uh, who is Joycelyn Savage, whose family has come out repeatedly in the media uh, and talked about the fact that they are, are worried for the health their daughters. We did see them here in court today. R. Kelly, again, has denied all the allegations against him, his attorney saying he is innocent. Ryan. Uh, and Sarah, we did see R. Kelly last night uh, when he uh, surrendered to authorities. What can you tell us about his de demeanor in court today? Uh, he stood uh, solemnly. He answered questions. Uh, he listened. His attorney was standing next to him. There were no outbursts, uh, though when he first came to court and when his name uh, was first called, we noticed that four people, four men who had come in uh, together, uh, stood up and stood up for the entire time that he was there. Uh, we know that there were people in that courtroom that support R. Kelly, that support him uh, not just as an artist but as a friend or family member. Uh, and so that is what we saw in the court on his side. Again, and a lot of emotion on the side of families uh, in this court today. Brian. All right, Sarah Seidner in Chicago, where R. Kelly uh, just uh, was at a bail hearing. Uh, thank you very much for that, Sarah. Let's talk more about this situation with CNN legal analyst and criminal defense uh, lawyer Joey Jackson and CNN senior entertainment writer Lisa France. Uh, Joey, let's first talk about the legal aspect yeah. here. R. Kelly now facing 10 criminal counts. He could face up to seven years in prison. Yeah. His lawyers calling all of these accusers liars right now. I mean, is that typical 
uh, of a defense attorney in a situation like this? So you have to be careful, Ryan. Uh, and I'm, you know, his lawyer, very experienced. We don't all do things as criminal defense attorneys the same way. But you have to be careful in as much as you don't want to re-victimize victims. You have to walk the fine line. The defense has many pitfalls here. Uh, the first pitfall, of course, is that we are in a new era. We're in an era of Me Too. We are in an era of Time's Up. We are in an era as of I'm mad as heck and I'm not going to take it anymore. Right. And you see the chickens coming home to roost. In that climate, you don't want to demonize victims. Uh, you don't want to assail them. But, but at the same time, the attorneys at, in the time of court are going to need to challenge the credibility. The other issue that is uh, quite concerning in this case is that you have four different victims in that indictment. Mm -hmm. And if you see, if you have seen any of the documentary and any of the compelling, uh, really, discussions and really testimonials that the women have given, it's compelling. Right. And I could only imagine how a jury would process that information. In addition to that, Ryan, you have the issue of any prior bad act evidence. That is, not that he's been convicted before he was acquitted, but you can use certain other women to come in and to say he did this to me right. too, showing motive, showing who it is, and just showing that this is you know what this guy is all about. And so the defense has a lot of pitfalls here. I want to point out presumption of innocence, yes. innocent until proven guilty. This is only an indictment. Us defense attorneys are quick to say an indictment is a mere accusation. Yep. Those grand jurors just sat there and they determined whether there was probable cause to believe that a crime was committed and he committed it. There's not a judge in the grand jury. They're not subject to cross-examination, mm -hmm. but still very significant development. It's one thing to call one person a liar, to call four potential people liars, uh, probably a whole different situation. And Lisa, Joey mentioned kind of the impact of this docu-series Surviving R. Kelly uh, has had on this particular case. I, you know, I remember when the first trial happened, there was all of these accu accusations about R. Kelly and then it seemed as though everybody forgot about it. This series runs again, and all of a sudden it comes to the forefront. How important do you think this docuseries played uh, in these charges being filed? Tremendously important, and also it cannot be stated enough that black women were the driving force behind this. Black women have been beating this drum for years, saying that R. Kelly needs to be brought to justice. And after Bill Cosby was convicted, there all of a sudden was, you know, a lot more conversation about, we're looking at this list of powerful men from Me Too has helped to bring down, where is R. Kelly's name? And black women consistently said, something needs to be done. Dream Hampton, black woman, the woman behind surviving R. Kelly. And I think it was much more difficult for people to say, you know, maybe this didn't really happen when you saw these women sharing their stories and their allegations and crying and you saw the amount of emotion with them and with their families, it could no longer be ignored. Now, honestly, that docuseries is difficult to watch because when you hear uh, from these survivors themselves tell about these awful situations they found themselves in. Joey, we are talking about evidence here and, and allegations that span over two decades. I mean, that goes all the way back to 1998 to 2010. You know, how important is the length of time that these accusations cover going to be in terms of presenting the, the evidence in the case? It's a great question, Ryan. And look, we have a statute of limitations for a reason. The statute of limitations exists because memories fade, witnesses disappear, and you want to make sure evidence doesn't go stale. At the same time, as long as these charges are brought within that applicable period of time, then it's a non-issue. Uh, mm -hmm. Just quickly, what ends up happening is, in terms of the statute, you have 20 years if you're a minor and you've been subject to alleged abuse. Uh, after your 18th birthday, that's until you're 38, in order to bring forth charges. The law has since changed, uh, and you know Illinois has joined 37 other states where there now is no statute of limitations, but you're dealing with the statute that existed at the time. On the core issue of how it's going to be treated evidentiary, obviously the defense attorneys are going to challenge the memory. Mm -hmm. They're going to challenge the consistencies of what they said or if there are any inconsistencies. And so timing and when timing did occur as to when these charges were alleged, it matters. But if the witnesses are credible, if the witnesses come forward as, as really sincere and authentic as they certainly appeared to me during that documentary. Yeah. Uh, again, I'm not uh, foreclosing the fact that he could be innocent. He certainly could. But it's very compelling, and I think it's going to be processed and looked at at that, ju at that jury, and they're really going to be asking, wow, could this really have occurred? And we also have videotape, which doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, the, what it looked like then is going to be the same as it looks now. And Lisa, finally to you, you know, this uh, movement known as Mute R. Kelly, really picked up steam after the docuseries rolled out. You know, we did see a bump in people listening to his music shortly after the docuseries came out. Well, where do things stand now? Are more of these streaming services pulling them from their air? Are radio stations playing him less? Radio stations have been playing him less for a while, and I think 
people forget that part of the reason why you had the bump is because there were people who weren't familiar with R. Kelly's music. You know, there mm -hmm. are some people, he has, still has a really strong fan base and he has a lot of supporters. But there were also people saying, you know what, hey, who is this R. Kelly guy? What is the situation all about? And checking out his music. So, you know, a lot has been made about, you know, why were people tuning in and listening to him when all these accusations were out there in the public media. But keep in mind, not everybody was aware of the R. Kelly story. But for those who know, they now are saying that this might actually be, you know, justice served for some of these women behind these allegations. So we'll just have to wait and see. You know, um, as you pointed out, he's innocent until proven mm -hmm. guilty. But there were a lot of hard feelings after he beat the charges in 2008.